going on guys? Justin Williams here with Dirt Time Adventures and I am out at Randolph, Kansas here in the beautiful part of eastern Kansas, northeastern Kansas. Uh, it's Fortunately it's not out west where it's completely flat. There's actually a very beautiful forest here. The sun's about to set on an awesome day. Um, not a whole lot of like in-depth hands-on training but it was more or less picking brains of experts in the field and guys who uh, live this type of lifestyle day in and day out. And for me, uh, those of you guys who don't know, I'm moving to South Carolina and going to be teaching at Trailblazer Survival School. And so for me, it was a perfect opportunity to come out here, pick some brains like guys like Dave Danger and John McPherson and Rocky Hollow, some of the guys that I really admire and have a lot of respect for who truly love this um, this field, this this uh, this art of self-reliance, and uh, so out here and on. Actually, we're at Blackthorn USA um, is the actual school that I'm at here, hanging out with Dave and uh, Rocky Hollow. But John McPherson, um, out of you know, just his love and passion to pass on these skills, has invited me out. So I spent some day, time today with him picking his brain so what I want to do is I'm going to share a little bit of the footage I didn't shoot a lot because it, I wasn't out there for YouTube I wasn't out there for um, you know to show anything particular I, I really just wanted to learn from him and uh, and not really in a training environment but more in a casual hey let me give you some real world advice and that meant more to me than um, learning some new survival technique. And so I'm very grateful for John and Jerry, um, uh, amazing woman who, she's got more knowledge, her and John both have more knowledge and primitive skills and they will have lost and not been able to retain more knowledge than I will ever probably obtain and so very honored to be able to spend time with them. So I just want to shoot a short clip and a video uh, that I want to share with you guys of some photos and some short video clips of what I learned. So before I show you some of the footage that I have with John McPherson, mainly it's going to be photos because uh, it's just easier. Um, I want to show you a little bit of the Blackthorn uh, camp and give you guys an idea of what their setup looks like, some things that you know, might try stealing. Sorry, Dave, I may steal it and implement at Trailblazer Survival School. This here is something that he calls a mass cooking stand, uh, a quad, cooking quad. Um, and I think he picked this up. Um, I'm not a mountain shepherd survival school. I don't even, I'm not even going to try to remember. Um, but this is an awesome cooking quad that you can run chains to hang pots off of and do long fires to do mass cooking. So I just, I really for my own benefit wanted to capture some of this and have it for my own records. But you guys can see it too. Um, just got it jointed here. If I can capture that. There we go, some better lighting. Jointed and nailed. And he's got it coated, and then, as you can see up here, a nice tight lashing for his quad. But anyways, so let me uh, show you guys over here just kind of a, a rain fly to get you out of the rain when you're training, which we plan to try to implement something like that as well. All the tinder you can need to get a fire going. And then, show you my setup over here. All right, so I've done a lot of primitive shelter camping and sleeping out in the woods. Spent 47 days living in a tree. Um, so anything that has man-made structures is a bonus for me. And I had the opportunity to try hammock sleeping last night. And uh, the verdict's still out. I, I'm, I haven't decided whether I love it or hate it yet. I'm a big guy, so I think there's just some techniques and some preferences in angles and heights and maybe even length of hammocks that I need to check into because 
Rocky Hollow's got one a little bit longer than mine. He says it's a little bit more comfortable. But he did, um, awesome guy loaned me one of his oil skin tarps. And so I'm testing it out, seeing how I like it. And uh, so far, it, it, it seems very durable, very sturdy. So if you're interested in oil skin, they're heavy. Um, so it's probably not something you want to backpack with. Um, got just a basic, there's nothing fancy about my hammock. It's like a $40 hammock um, that you can pick up in any outdoor store that I just wanted to test out and see how I liked it. Um, if I like it, I may invest in an Eno or uh, something, go all out and go for a full war bonnet system, but probably not. <laughs> um, I do got a, tar a ground tarp, so worst comes to worst, I'm miserable and I can't sleep in it. I can just throw it on a ground tarp and sleep on it, which I've been known to do. So uh, this is my setup. This is what I've been sleeping in, hanging out here in the evenings and training with John during the day. And so um, I hope you enjoy some of these clips, some of these images and a little bit of the short video footage. Um, like I said, I, I'm very honored and, and very grateful for John McPherson and, and Jerry both, and Dave uh, uh, Carlson, Dave Danger. Dave has uh, uh, been awesome to open up his property to me and give me some advice on starting a school, running a school. So, man, just, I can't thank these guys enough. And then I got Rocky Hollow out here too. The Rocky Hollow, um, I mean, that guy doesn't get near the credit he deserves. He's very skilled, very talented, um, and he's the, one of the most hospitable people that I've ever met. And so I know what goes around comes around, and awesome things are coming for um, Rocky Hollow. So uh, be sure to find all these guys on Facebook, Dave Danger, Rocky Hollow, and John McPherson. And... Uh, um, and be sure to look up uh, Trailblazer Survival School, where I'm going. And uh, if you're interested in checking out uh, Blackthorn, check them out too, Blackthorn USA. So I'm out here at the McPherson Homestead and uh, just been able to spend the last few days with John and Jerry and a lot of what we've been doing is just picking their brains about, you know, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, living independent and living off the grid and then being able to apply, you know, primitive skills and some natural skills to that type of lifestyle and so I wanted to Go ahead and shoot some footage of some of the things that I'd like to implement in my homestead and my uh, primitive living situation eventually. You know, it's something that you just don't do overnight. It's something you develop and you work towards. Um, so these are things I definitely want to have some footage of so that uh, I can look back on and be like, yeah, that's, I remember John telling me that's how it was. So, um, so come along with me and I'll show you some of the things that I think are really interesting and uh, some things that you might be able to implement in your homestead setting as well. Something that I thought was really neat and fascinating about this property is John has 
uh, buildings put all along and on these log cabins I was really amazed at how I was always taught that you know you, you see that the the structures are flat and here the they just they're just long logs that they they didn't worry about planing which I thought was huge because that takes so much time and so much energy so I wouldn't have to plane my boards I could just fill them in with a, a form of concrete or mortar and so but when you walk in the front door there's two cabins yeah but the one on the left as you walk in that main gate if you go around the back side of it there's a section there that Jerry actually used clay and it, it's just a small section so it's not cement but it's clay mm -hmm. and it's held up still there we figured it wouldn't make it through the first winter yeah and uh, so you know that was 12 years ago yeah well, I, th I think my thinking for something mainly for outbuildings was there'll be plenty of pines and cedars and so you know all the guy do is cut notches, and then if they don't line up perfect, then I can just fill them in. I mean, as long as your right. footer and your your headers are level. Um, well, it's like the video that on the fort building that you got. Mm -hmm. You'll say that the narrator comes through there at one point, and he says, "This is something I, I like about what John says is he puts these logs together as it just sloppy fits. Mm -hmm. I just make them overly big, and I fill up the difference. Because uh, otherwise, if you try to fit, it just takes long." And I was trying to put up something in a hurry. Yeah. And, uh, and now when we did the other house, I tried to fit a little bit tighter, but still I wasn't concerned because I just filled a gap. Yeah. It's no big deal. Well, i got to run that generator again, and that might interfere with the filming, but... No, I so this is the world-renowned dugout canoe that John did. Um, built it all by hand with primitive tools and you can see all the tool marks in it so which it's just a piece of art man this thing probably weighs four or five hundred pounds though and just taking native skills and building functional pieces of work and just amazing you notice around the property he has a fetish, I think, with wood. <laughs> He's got more piles of wood than anybody I've ever seen. He, uh, I really like this, too, because he stacked up all these little pyramids of wood that he uses for fence posts, for structures, for, um, for fencing, period. And instead of just tossing it all on the ground to rot, it's multi-purpose. One, it... Um, keeps it from rotting on the ground and two it allows him to look through it to find pieces that he wants to use and then instead of just having to dig through all the layers of wood to find that one piece he can just walk around these towers and find a piece that fits his specific need at that point And back here is his firewood operation, which is crucial for any homestead to have adequate means to heat their homes and cook and prepare meals. And he estimates that he has over three or four years worth of firewood. Um, I think it's important to stock those things. He said that he cut most of that by hand um, before eventually getting a log splitter. Uh, you might be able to hear in the background a generator and may have seen a tractor. Um, these are all modern technologies that he hasn't brought on until just the last you know, five, ten years because of uh, just the workloads get heavier and age gets to you. And John's more active than most 20-year-old guys, so I don't want to discredit him there at all but uh, definitely uh, I love how he's not so set in his ways that he's unwilling to 
use technology to his benefit so that he can continue to live a life that he wants to live. One of the things John has completely and continually implemented in the things that he's talking to me about is realizing that there's a wrong way to do things and a right way to do things and it's always best to do it the right way first but at the same time your way may be different than someone else's so you got to find what works for you and find what it is that you're in pursuit of because that's that's my thing is I came out here um, I didn't know what to expect other than I really was excited to hear and have just John pour into me a little bit because you just you that's that type of thing is invaluable and uh, to be able to get his some advice and um, more than anything instead of him saying this is how you do this uh, his approach every time has been to challenge my thinking and well what do you really want out of this and so um, that's really caused me to think about what do I want to achieve in a living circumstances and so for many of you know that I'm going to be going and teaching survival skills um, but there's an there's an aspect of it outside of teaching these skills where you have to ask yourself how do you personally want to live um, and that's something that I'm in a pursuit of too not just a career or a hobby or an interest in teaching these skills but I'm at the same time I'm in a journey trying to figure out how I want to live my life um, the whole concept what do I want to be when I grow up well how do I want to live when I grow up um, we grow up into these social structures and these these um, these molds of how you're supposed to live. You're supposed to work hard, build a big house, move up to a bigger house, move up to a bigger house. And you're constantly in a pursuit of something that doesn't give you true passion and purpose. And so for me, um, seeing his property, it, it, he's got all kinds of structures on it, which I think are amazing. Um, but that's something that he's developed over 30 years. And so it's something that's not going to happen overnight. So you got to find out what's going to work for you in an initial setup and then build upon that and that's for me where I'm kind of torn because I want to travel I want to be able to teach skills I want to participate in rendezvous I want to go hike the Appalachian Trail and so I don't want to be completely tied down to a property but I don't want to be so indebted to society and so caught up in it that I that I still can't get away and from the rat race of life. Um, so for me, you know, I've been thinking through this process. We did uh, sign a lease on a property in South Carolina, but eventually, you know, in the next year or two, as the Trailblazer Survival is more successful, I want to settle down and find some property and build. And um, so those, I got time to contemplate those things. But being out here with John has definitely allowed me to process those thoughts a lot sooner, and possibly even push me in that direction to get started on it sooner um, because eventually I'd love to be off grid um, at least um, from the main system be able to use solar and hydropower wells um, so there's all kinds of resources and opportunities um, so hope as you uh, are watching this video that maybe you're getting some ideas and if anything you just get to enjoy my experience as well so um, I'll show you a few other things This here's the cabin that John built and put into his book, How to Build a Cabin for $3,000. And I uh, highly encourage you, I think it's out of print, but if you can find it, um, amazing book to get if you're interested in building a log cabin. And this one here is um, a perfect example of what I was trying to say earlier and that John was reiterating about the, the structure and the logs being split. Um, and not they're just they're just straight up logs instead of um, trying to plane them out flat and then just using the caulking and the mortar to to fill them in so this is a two level cabin um, it's uh, now Jerry's workshop for her horse stuff so let's peek in real quick And it's just same thing. All the, the rafters were, they were plain to be flat. And you can use just a basic chainsaw jig to accomplish that now. Um, kind of a 
look at the upper and you realize real quickly when you get into this type of lifestyle this one here once again has been turned into a horse workshop they have some horses out here but there's no reason that someone couldn't live comfortably in um, a structure like this it's got plenty of lighting so it's really open it doesn't feel super claustrophobic and everything is just made from natural materials for the most part the windows were bought um, used I think he said he paid like $30 a piece for them and so beautiful structures so much history and nostalgia <laughs> this is what I think is neat over here. This is one of my favorites. My kids would love that. <laughs> it's just an old burnout stump. This here is an old wigwam structure that they had thatched and with grass and tried different methods. And this is something at their property. They they used the whole thing. Um, for doing their training with uh, some of the special forces guys and so um, little older structures like this throughout so here's the their actual cabin where they live and as you can see on top there's some solar panels and they have a four panel setup and then to the left of it you can't see there's a two panel and then on top is another panel and they have all kinds of different um, all kinds of different converters and battery power boxes and all kinds of stuff for that. So their main power source is solar, um, other than the generators to operate the well house and uh, every once in a while a few other. Here is the infamous flint napping yard. Everybody needs a flint napping yard and some beautiful pieces here that just I'm afraid to even touch them look at that one Let's see if I can get it there isn't that a gorgeous piece look how smooth that is right in there beautiful many of them but the grit of these is just about what I like to grab the stone transfer its energy it's more of a sandstone but it's not a hard sandstone it's not soft sandstone it's just I don't they work for the type of flint that I work with and then uh, I've got a couple more of them in here and shapes come in handy because now you can treat that one almost like a baton mm -hmm. so you get a little bit more right but that's got to fall into it so it's not gonna last real long and then there'd be something like this, which is a soft one. That's likely going to break, but it gives me adaptability if I don't have a baton to mm -hmm. get the same type of function out of it. So I'm just I'm using the pad because it, it does assist. Yeah. Uh, in I can do it on my bare leg, but I, I'll just do better up here. Not on everything, but some of what I'll do. Let's use this. Let's just get some.